Welcome back to our introductory uh, statistics series. I'm Mark Ledbetter, and this is lecture video five. We are in chapter two, and this is part three of chapter two. And last time we made a uh, frequency table and a relative frequency table, which are shown here. Um, the difference between the uh, frequency table and the relative frequency table is the inclusion of this column of relative frequency. So again, you need to know all the vocabulary so that when I mention uh, these different quantities that you know what I'm talking about, all right? So this time we're going to cover uh, histograms. We're going to make a histogram using the frequency table and a relative frequency histogram using the relative frequency table. And then we're going to talk briefly about the different shapes that distributions have. So here's the... Uh, frequency and relative frequency table that we made last time and the data. So we're going to use this to make a histogram and a relative frequency histogram. So to do this I'm first going to give it a title. So histogram of uh, commuting distance uh, one way for Dallas, Texas, let's say. All right, now I need two axes, so a vertical and a horizontal. Now, I'm going to do this, if I just say a histogram, we're using the frequencies. So to make the scale for the vertical, I need to look at the biggest frequency and make sure that my vertical scale covers it. If you're gonna write this by hand, please make these increments on your scale easy for you. So I'm going to make it five. So let's say five, 10, 15, 20, 25. 25 is above 21, so that makes it pretty easy. So I'm gonna put an F over here for frequency for that axis. And over here on the horizontal axis, I'm going to make six bars. So I'm starting with my um, class boundaries here. So these are the values where the lines for the different bars occur. So um, I'm going to start with 0.5 and then this is going to be 8.5. So that's going to be my first bar is going, going to be between those two numbers. And then I go to 16.5. Let's make that a little easier to read. 16.5. 24.5, 32.5, 40.5, and so sometimes that happens where we need to make the line a little bit bigger. That's fine, so 48.5. All right, so I can label my values, and now I'm also going to give this axis uh, an axis title or label, and I'm going to call it distance. And I'm going to put the units in parentheses, and that's pretty standard to do. All right, so the first bar needs to be at the height of 14. See, my first uh, bar is has a frequency of 14. So I'm going to say that 14 is about there, and I'm going to do my best to draw a nice straight bar. And to keep the reader from being confused, I'm going to use data labels. This makes it very easy for the reader to see the value without having to uh, try to interpolate with the scale. And so my next value is going to be a 21. Notice how I use the same line for both bars. In other words, there's no gaps between these bars. And so the next one's going to be 11. Let's say that's about here. And then I have six, let's say that is about here, and then four for the next two. All right, so now I am finished with a histogram, and I can look at the shape of the histogram. Again, if I'm going to uh, compare this or standardize it, I'm going to make it a relative frequency histogram. So let's call it a relative frequency histogram of one-way commute uh, distance 
in Dallas, Texas. All right. So again, I need to have two axes. But this time, instead of being frequency, this is going to be relative frequency. And my scale has to be less than 1. In fact, I don't even need it to go all the way to 1. I just need it to go above 0.35. So I'm going to make my scale um, 0.1. 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0.4. All right. And so now I'm going to do my first value, which is 0.233. And oh, but before I do that, I need to make 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All right. So this starts at 0.5, 8.5. 16.5, 24.5, 32.5, 40 and 48.5. Now, I do prefer putting the um, boundary values on the plot so that I know where the bars are, um, but there are three different ways to plot those values. So we'll go over that in just a minute. But it's you have to have the tick marks where the bars are going to go. So this first bar is going to go up to 0 0.233. Again, I'm not going to worry about exactly where that is. I'm going to approximate it, and then I'm going to put 0.233 by it. The next one has to go up to 0.35. Let's say that's about there. 0 0.350. The next one's 0 0.183, which is about there. And then point 0.1, which is about there. And then point 0.067, we'll say that those are about that height for both of those. 0.067 and point 0.067. All right. So now, oh, and I need to put my units down here. So now I have a relative frequency histogram. Notice that the shape between the frequency histogram and the relative frequency histogram are similar. They're not the same exactly uh, because the scale is a little different, but they're very similar. So depending on uh, how you did your scale, they could be exact, but they're going to look similar. The difference is the relative frequency, I can now look at those as a distribution. Uh, think about it like a distribution and say, oh, now I can compare this to something else if I wanted to, say the commute distances in um, Houston, Texas, for instance. All right. So um, I promised to talk about the different ways that you can label um, this horizontal axis. And by the way, you can do these uh, horizontally. You can flip them uh, so that they're horizontal, and people do that. I prefer not to, but it is possible. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. So these were the boundaries. You could also use the... Um, class midpoint. Of course, the midpoints are in the center. So the midpoint here would be here, and that would be 4.5 and 12.5, etc. All right. So you could use the class midpoint. The third way you could do this is to just use the, um, the classes themselves. So I could say uh, 1 to 8, 9 to uh, 17, and so forth. So these are the class limits. Okay, both. Okay, so those are the three different ways you can do it. You can label that axis. All right, so if the problem doesn't tell you which way to do it, then you're welcome to use any one of those three methods. It's up to you. All right. Now that we've done that, let's talk about the different shapes that we have here, the distri distribution shapes. So the first, your book calls it mound shape. Um, I call this, uh, really, it's bell-shaped. So you'll see, though, that it raises up, that it goes up, and then it comes down, and that both sides are about the same. So it's called symmetric. Symmetric means that I can draw a line down the middle and the half 
on the left and the half on the right are basically the same, except that they are mirror images of each other. The other way to think about this, if I folded it down this center line here, if I folded it in half, that both sides, when I fold them up, would match or approximately match. Okay. Now the next distribution is called the uniform or rectangular shape uh, distribution, and it also is um, uh, symmetric. Again, if I take a line down the middle and I fold it down that line, the two halves are going to match up. They are, again, mirror images of each other. So um, here, you'll notice I didn't draw this perfect because, and, and I didn't draw the mound shape or the bell shape curve or the histogram perfectly symmetrical either because in real life our data is not perfect. So we're just looking to see if it's going to be approximately bell-shaped, if it's approximately uniformly distributed, okay? So a uniform distribution, the heights are all the same, that this would be a straight line, there would be no variation. Um, but again, when you're taking a data from that, it's not going to be exactly that way. You're just looking to see if it's close. And uh, this is, in, in fact, very close. Both of these are very, very close, much closer than you would probably get in real life. Now, this other shape is in C is what we call a left, uh, skewed left or skewed to the left histogram. So the reason is that if I look at this and I compare it to the bell shape or symmetric mound shape curve, it looks like I've taken this left tail over here, and I've grabbed it and I've stretched it in that direction. Okay, so I've skewed it by by making this left side no longer look like the um, bell shape or mound shape curve. I've skewed it to the left. So the long tail is on the left. The long tail of the distribution is on the left, okay? So students tend to get this um, mixed up because they look at where most of the data is instead of the irregularity of the shape. So it's really about how the shape has changed. Which side of this curve doesn't look like a mound shape or symmetrical bell shape anymore, and it's the left side. The same thing with the right skewed distribution. Um, it is, and that wasn't very pretty uh, as far as my drawing, but um, I'm not an artist, so please forgive me. All right, so we'll do this. And again, it's the right tail that has been skewed or stretched, uh, and it's the longer tail. And then finally, we have the bimodal distribution. This has two peaks. Notice again, in real life, it's not exact. So... I could draw this as something having um, two peaks, all right? So that's bimodal. We can have three modes. We can have four modes. As soon as we get to three or more modes, that's really a bad thing in statistics. It's complicated. It's bad because it's complicated and difficult to deal with. And so three or more we just call multimodal. Okay, so bimodal, we, we have a lot of procedures for uh, bimodal situations, but not very many that are more than that. Okay, so that is our discussion on histograms and distribution shapes. So please don't forget to scan your notes by midnight on the due date for this video. Uh, make your notes neat. Make sure you include what you need to so that when you go back to review this, you can do the homework and you can study easily for the test. Um, please make sure that you uh, would update for any formulas. We didn't talk about any formulas today, um, but if we had, you'd always want to add those. Again, if you have questions um, that weren't answered in this video, you're welcome at virtual office hours. Uh, if those times don't work for you or you need a more immediate response, feel free to email me. I am always happy to help you. So I hope to see you next time. Until then, think statistics.